Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Brabber, and today it's going to be a solo episode. Logan is traveling, so I tweeted out to you guys and said, fire away, ask me all the questions that you want for a solo mailbag episode. That's what we'll be doing today. I do want to start first, though, with the biggest story in the NBA and I haven't been able to touch on yet, that being Russell Wilson's benching in Denver and reports that he is very likely going to be cut this March. And this has been a divisive issue because there's a narrative going around that Russ was actually playing at a really high level. And that's basically entirely predicated upon his touchdown interception ratio, which is quite good. And the fact that the Broncos as a team were hot for a bit, not on the back of what Russ was doing, more so on the back of defense crazy turnover differential, them finding much more of an identity with the run game. But Russ just wasn't playing very well this year. It was his fewest passing yards per game since his rookie season, his fewest yards per pass attempt ever, and he was behind a Broncos offense that was 25th in total passing yards, 21st in passing yards per attempt, 25th in total yards overall. He just was leading one of the weaker offenses in the NFL, and it really felt like the entire year – he had the kid gloves on. He was really just game managing. The one thing that he did well was avoid turnovers, but he was still leaving throws on the table. He certainly was not creating out of structure at the high level that we would have seen from him a few years ago. And I don't think he's a good fit in Sean Payton's system. So long term, it makes sense that they would want to move off of him, especially because obviously of the historic contract that he is owed. And they still have to take $85 million in dead cap because of this, which sucks, presuming that they do cut him, because the Broncos are just not a talented enough team to compensate for that sort of wasted resources. Like, they're an okay defense. When you take out the fact that they allowed 70 to the Dolphins, they've progressed, but they're not in the top tier, certainly. I still wouldn't call them a top 10 defense. Cortland Sutton is a solid wide receiver one. Again, they found something decent with the running game, but it's just hard to find a lot of things that this team does at a very high level. And Russ was an example of that. And this is the bed that they made. They've really screwed themselves for several years here. That's what happens when you give a historic contract to a quarterback who is just not at that level anymore. And I do still think that Sean Payton is a pretty damn good offensive coach. I think if you look at what he's done in recent years, making 40-year-old Drew Brees who couldn't throw the ball 10 yards downfield, a guy who still had elite efficiency and statistical production in that sense, a guy who people still believed in deeply, to me that doesn't happen without Sean Payton. And I think that he's still responsible for rejuvenating Russ to some extent this year. I mean, Russ was broken last year. He was missing reads all over the place. He was turning the ball over more. He was really one of the worst starting quarterbacks in the NFL. I think he was a level up from that this year, but still just not nearly good enough to inspire real confidence in him with the organization. And Sean Payton just seemed to not like him. They just seemed to not gel. So it's a bummer to see how things have gone for Russ these past couple years because I was so, so high on him in his last few years in Seattle. Well, maybe not his last season, but the two previous to that. I mean, I thought he was playing at an MVP level. I thought he was as good as he's ever been. And I fear that this combined with the fact that people just don't like Russ could lead to some revisionist history of, oh, he was always just carried by those Seahawks defenses. But it's worth remembering that after beast mode, after the Legion of Boom, when that team didn't protect very well, he still was consistently carrying them to over 10 win seasons on the back of him being a top five sort of quarterback. So falling off once you're in your thirties does not rewrite that history but again, if people are going to try to credit Russ for the fact that this team got hot for a stretch, they turned it around when they started relying less on Russ and more on the running game. They were doing everything around him better. It really had very little to do with him. So this is definitely the right decision from the Broncos perspective. I mean, Jared Stidham is going to suck, but they've basically taken themselves out of the playoff conversation at this point. Anyways, and even if they did get there, they wouldn't do anything serious. In terms of Russ's future, I think there's some interesting landing spots. I think you could look at either the Patriots or the Raiders, teams who you think are going to have those defensive foundations that make them competitive football teams. But right now, 
have really low level quarterback play. Problem with the Raiders, of course, is that they gave Jimmy G the contract, but he is not good. He's certainly not as good as Russ. And the Pats are certainly going to have to move in another direction. They're not trotting out Bailey Zappi as their day one starter. Now, both those teams also could be in position to take not Caleb Williams or Drake May, but possibly Jaden Daniels. And I think that that makes more sense for both franchises. I think you have to look at the long-term option, the high upside option at quarterback, because if you're not going to do that as the Raiders, why did you move on from Derek Carr? And for the Pats, I think that we have seen how things have trended downwards in these last few years in which they have committed to trying to stay competitive and it just hasn't worked. And now they're one of the worst teams in football anyways. I think that they need to build for the future in both cases. But somebody's going to make Russ a starter next year. I think he's capable enough that he is going to be a starter for a team that is in that win now mode. And I don't think that he's going to totally compromise things for you. I just don't think he's going to take you to that next level and really elevate you anymore. Okay. Wanted to touch on that before we got into the specific questions. But this one is related to the last football action that we saw just last night. Aiden Williams asks... Are the Browns Super Bowl contenders with their dominant defense and a hot Joe Flacco? Flacco is a pretty good looking guy. Here's what I'll say. Flacco is playing with ridiculous confidence right now. And I saw a friend of the show, Matt Sponauer, tweeted out before this past game what his stats would be on pace for over a 17 game season if he started all year. And those numbers have changed a bit now. So I recalculated them. His pace over a full season, extrapolating his numbers. 5,491 passing yards, 44 touchdowns, 27 interceptions. Just hilarious. Numbers that obviously we've never seen before when you put those three factors together. But he has added the dimension that this team has been sorely lacking all year. And that is a legit passing attack. They didn't even have it with healthy Deshaun. They certainly didn't have it with DTR or PJ Walker before Flacco took over. They were 27th in passing yards with nine touchdowns to 13 interceptions, one of the worst passing attacks in the NFL. And since he took over, he has the most passing yards in football, and they are averaging almost 29 points per game. They have turned to a dynamic offense, and they've been doing that in a stretch in which they're struggling to run the ball much more than normal, averaging like three yards per carry, and they're not running it all that much. So Flacco is carrying this offense to play better football than it has all year and I think that we have seen David Njoku really blossom in this stretch he's been playing well all year but Flacco is utilizing him more that guy is just a big old mismatch he's great after the catch and the one thing that we always said is the reason you can't take the Browns seriously is because they weren't ultimately a serious offense even if they were running the ball well and they were good in the trenches when they had that sort of incompetent quarterback play and Flacco is far from that I mean he's playing really really well right now now, do I view them as Super Bowl contenders? This year is a tricky one because there's only two teams who week in, week out, I'm like, yeah, you're pretty damn good. I view you as a bona fide Super Bowl contender in the traditional sense, that being the Niners and the Ravens. Outside of that, everybody's got flaws. Everybody's got bad losses. Niners have bad losses. So do the Ravens. Nobody's perfect this year, but I do think that those two teams are pretty clearly better than the rest of the pack. I think there are teams, though, that have this combination of elite team defense with an overall offense that I trust more, with even higher level quarterback play than Flacco, who, although I think is seeing the game at a high level and he does some things that are just really nice from a veteran quarterback, he's a really good play action guy. He's really good in terms of beating the blitz, right? He's just going to quickly process things and make the right read. He's been pretty accurate as a thrower he's a solid pocket passer his arm isn't shot he can still push the ball downfield but i do think you get very limited mobility from him that matters in today's nfl and ultimately he is still a bit turnover prone i mean it's the same joe flacco that we've always known and loved so he's a huge upgrade but i look at the ravens whose defense is better than the browns and they have an elite quarterback and an elite offense i look at a team like the chiefs who may have all these offensive issues, but at the end of the day, I think their defense is as good as the Browns and they have Patrick Mahomes. So I'm going to have more faith in them. Even the Dolphins, man. I mean, that defense has been balling out recently. I'm still probably not the highest on the Dolphins, but a few weeks ago, 
And throughout a lot of the year, I've been a real skeptic. I think that, to me, it has been the progress of that defense into what is playing like a top 10 unit now that sells me on them more. The Bills are a hotter football team with this overwhelming talent at quarterback. Like, there's enough teams in the AFC alone, and then you look at the NFC, and you have the Niners. I still would probably take the Cowboys and the Eagles and the Lions. I think that those are probably more complete football teams, even with the Lions and Eagles defensive issues, just because they're so stacked offensively. The Browns are really good. And it's not that they're incapable of beating any of those teams that I just mentioned. Honestly, I mean, if Flacco balls out, especially like he did yesterday, putting up numbers against the Jets that we almost haven't seen all year. I mean, that has been the quarterback stopping defense. And he had 300 yards and three touchdowns by halftime. Just obscene. They have the upside to beat anybody. Would I pick them to, though, is the other question. I am going to say that they are fringe Super Bowl contenders. It's not impossible It is definitely not likely, though. But either way, I mean, what a fine for them. And at the same time, how painful that you can just call 40-year-old Joe Flacco off his couch and he's way better than the guy who you paid a historic contract to in Deshaun Watson. Not great in that sense, but I'm sure that the Browns fans are just enjoying winning games like this. Okay, let's move to NBA here for a second. We've got a question from friend of the show, Jokic Joestar. You can add Lowry Markinen or... Macal Bridges to the Thunder for identical packages. What do you do and why? I would trade for Lowry in this situation. And I think the first reason for that is that I believe he's just a better basketball player. I think that he is a more consistently elite offensive force for sure. I think that Macal, we've seen as you put him in this higher volume role for an extended stretch, He's struggling a little bit. He's quite reliant on the difficult shot making. As a playmaker, he's only so-so. Lowry is a guy who doesn't need to dominate the ball, but is so brutally efficient as a shooter and then has such physical advantages as a mismatch attacker, is so smart off ball as a cutter. You're just getting more consistent production from him. But he's also a much better fit with the Thunder. And that's the other thing with Macau. The reason that I'm saying Lowry is a better player at this point, I focused mostly on offense there. And some people are probably thinking, well, does McCall have a significant two-way edge? Because this is a guy who a couple years ago was all defense. That was his calling card, right? It was just doing the complimentary stuff. Off ball, cutting, knocking down shots, and defending his ass off. But he has not been defending at that level this year. And as he has taken on a larger offensive role, I think that we've seen his energy and his ability to compete like that defensively just really diminish. So if both these guys are going to be offensive first value, I think Lowry is the better offensive player and the fit is significantly better. The Thunder do not need another wiry 6'6 guy. They just don't. What they need is more size in the front court. They need a guy you can put alongside Chet, another seven footer, who's also 240, who is athletic, who's pretty strong. That, to me, is where Lowry fits. And Mikal doesn't need the ball, and I don't want to pretend that he does just because he's been playing more in that style because in Phoenix we saw that he was an awesome, awesome off-ball player. But Lowry is, like, maybe the one dude in the NBA today who I look at and I'm like, he is a bona fide all-star, bona fide star player offensively who barely needs the ball. He is just going to always play within the flow of your offense. He's so versatile there. And that, to me, is a really good fit with the Thunder because they already have multiple ball handlers who you love with Jalen Williams, with SGA. I think finding a guy who can just complement them, who you can use as a screener, who can attack mismatches when he gets switches, and who can just overall stress a defense without having to handle the ball, that's perfect to me. So I think that it's pretty clearly Lowry. And I think that Lowry makes them a real, real contender. And again, like that's a guy who's a really good rebounder. Macau is going to bring you very little value there. The one flaw that the Thunder have is that they can get bullied. And they can certainly get bullied on the glass. They're 29th in rebound rate. They're just not built like a grown man team yet in the front court. Lowry would fix that while bringing awesome offensive value and being a really good fit there. Very good question though. Shout out Jokic Joestar. He's the man. I love that guy. All I want for the holidays this year is some NBA action. This week, new customers can score 150 instantly in bonus bets just for betting five bucks. An instant dub just for you. 
Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code NERDS. New customers can get 150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on basketball only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code NERDS. The crown is yours. Evan Hale, shout out, a staple in our Discord, asks, is Joel Embiid the person whose legacy would benefit the most from winning a championship currently in the NBA? This to me is a no-brainer, by far. And the first reason is that I think he's on pace to win his second consecutive MVP this year. And if he does do that, he will join Carl Malone and Steve Nash as the only multiple-time MVP winners without a title. It's not a good club to be in. Most of those guys, almost all of them are just indisputably stamped as top 20 players of all time. Malone, some people would certainly have there, but you could argue that with his playoff regression and lack of winning the title, he doesn't belong. And Steve Nash, I think most people would have outside of that top 20. When you have the two MVPs and a championship, then you're stamped as an all-timer. And we have seen the pressure that gets applied to you once you have those two MVPs and you do not have the ring. Like, it hit real quick for Giannis. Giannis went from being everybody's favorite up-and-coming star to, wow, this guy is an overwhelmingly dominant physical force, back-to-back -back MVP, to, hey, can this guy get it done in the playoffs? Like, that really escalates quickly. Same exact thing just happened for Jokic. Back-to-back -back MVP, and then throughout the entire year, the story is, he can't get it done in the playoffs, even though he was great there individually. Everybody's picking at all these things in his game, whether they're real or not, that they can call out. And Embiid is going to be in the most dramatic version of that situation because he's already dealing with that after just the one MVP and after being at a superstar level for multiple years and never having made a conference final and never having looked like himself in an extended playoff run. Since 2018 in the regular season, he's been over 28 points per game, 62% true shooting. In the playoffs, 24 points per game under 58% true shooting. Last year was as dramatic a drop-off in playoff performance versus regular season as we've seen from an MVP. His turnovers always go up in the playoffs. His assists always go down. He averages more turnovers than assists in the playoffs. Like, there's almost nothing more than Embiid can prove in the regular season. And I say almost because he's playing even better than last year right now. And he is legitimately putting forth one of the great regular seasons that we have ever seen right now. He's been better than last year. Last year was already a historically great regular season, though. And that got forgotten and diminished pretty quickly when he went out there and he laid an egg in the playoffs. So to me, there's no question that it's Embiid. You can look at a Jason Tatum and say, that's a guy who is also fighting this reputation of doesn't get it done in the biggest moments and has had these incredibly stacked teams, but hasn't taken them over the top to win the title. But he doesn't have those sort of individual accolades. So I don't think that the pressure is the same. He is also a little bit younger. You could look at Kevin Durant and say, how much is it going to hurt his legacy having made his bed in consecutive situations after Golden State where they haven't won the title, where he has put together these super teams with these really big names and it hasn't ultimately led to him hosting the Larry OB. I think that those are both real guys who do have a lot of pressure, but who would benefit a lot from winning it, but nobody more than my Embi than Embiid, in my opinion. Now, a follow-up to that comes from RJ. Is it reasonable for me to expect the Sixers to have a chance to make it past the second round this year? They certainly have a good chance. This team is awesome. I think that they are clearly better than last year's team in a few areas, their wings are definitely better. Kelly Oubre back now. Nick Batum. Those guys are upgrades. Two-way players. Bring shooting. Oubre brings the ability to handle and create a little bit and is a really good athlete. I like their role-playing guards. D'Anthony Melton. Just really good. I love that guy. Does so many positive things for a basketball team. Pat Bev is a solid rotational piece at the very least. And then Embiid is even better than last year. And because they don't have James Harden out there anymore... I think their overall defensive ceiling is higher. So I think that this is a better team than last year. Definitely. And of course, you are no longer relying on Harden in a volume role when he almost always regresses in the playoffs because of his lack of variety as a shot maker, because of his reliance on getting to the line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I was worried that they wouldn't have enough offensive punch when you subtract him, even if you expected him to regress. But I think that now 
they have at least as much as last year because Tyrese Maxey is like an all NBA level guard right now. And they have added some more offensive skill on the wings and whatnot. The problem here is that the top three out East is really good. And I do still have more faith in Milwaukee's top four. I think if you're going down that list, all right, I would take Giannis over Embiid. I think that we have seen his play style, although he has a flaw in terms of his half-court creation, translate to the playoff stage at a higher level. The 2021 run, the 2022 run, he can just physically overwhelm you. And physical dominance is really valuable in playoff scenarios. Whereas Embiid, his body tends to break down a bit. His jump shot tends to fall apart. He tends to struggle as a playmaker. He's having a career jump shooting season. He's having a career playmaking season. We just need to see it. And we have already seen it from Giannis. And then Damon Maxey. I mean, Maxey's been playing at a higher level this regular season. I think I probably still marginally prefer Dame in a playoff setting. And I think that the stress that he puts on defenses with how far he pulls defenders out, running that high pick and roll with what he can do as a playmaker in those situations, probably still a bit more valuable to me. I think Brooke Lopez overall has a bit more of an impact on winning than a Tobias Harris. And then Middleton is better than any other player on that Sixers roster. Like the Sixers depth, I do prefer. And if Embiid can sustain this level in a playoff run, then maybe I would pick them over the Bucs. Until I see that though, I just can't do it. They'd be a really, really tough out, but Milwaukee is damn good. Now Milwaukee does have a more glaring weakness in their point of attack defense, but I think their overwhelming talent at the top of the roster outweighs that. One more question from RJ on the Sixers. Do you think they trade Tobias Harris and what is the best return you think they could get? Probably not. I don't see many really good teams trading for him right now. You're going to have to give him an extension. The massive $40 million a year contract that he's been on is expiring at the end of this year. But I'm not sure I see the market for that when I look at the contenders around the league. I don't see lots of really good teams who need somebody in that archetype. And for the Sixers, you also need somebody who you can who can offer you real immediate value back. Like a player as good as Tobias Harris right now is what you need. You're not looking for long-term assets because you have Joel Embiid and because you're the three seed in the East right now, you're trying to win a damn title. Like if you send him to the Pistons, which is the rumor, which is hilarious, Toby back to the Pistons. Think about that return. You can get Bojan and uh, who else that matters right now? I mean, there's only a couple other serious basketball players on that team. And you're not getting Cade Cunningham. You're not getting Jalen Duran. So even if the Pistons were stupid enough to give you picks, I don't know if that's a net positive because how much do those matter down the line? It's good to have assets because maybe then you can package that into a star. But I would say that they probably will not trade him. But I mentioned the Pistons. Emma asks... Which team will Detroit beat to end the streak? They almost did it last night. They came really, really close. That was fun. They were up 19 on the Celtics at the half for those who didn't see and then ended up taking it to overtime and lost. I said this on Hoops Tonight with Jason Timp yesterday. By the way, Logan and I went on, had a bunch of fun, covered a bunch of NBA stuff. Go check that out if you want. I think they will win one of their next three games. I think they will beat either the Raptors or the Jazz. Those are two deeply flawed basketball teams. And the Pistons, as crazy as it sounds to say, aren't that bad when Cade, Dern, and Bojan are all out there. Obviously, this team has won 28 straight games. Oh, I wish. They wish. Lost 28 straight games. But they've only had all those dudes out there for four games. And they have been very competitive in all of those games. When I look at the Wizards with their defensive and rebounding ineptitude, when I look at the Spurs, I mean, with their just all around struggles in terms of basketball IQ and they're struggling mightily on both sides of the ball. I think the Pistons are actually better than both when they are fully healthy. Cade has been awesome over his last six games. He's averaging 32 points, seven assists a night, 57% from the field, 46% from three. His shot has been falling in a big way, which has been the one thing that I've been holding out for. I've been saying he is a much better jump shooter than the numbers have indicated. And we are seeing that now. And then he's just a big guard who continues to look more comfortable, who can get to his spots, who's playmaking at a high level. And he has less overwhelming defensive attention on him because of how ridiculously bad the spacing is. Like he still has a real, real burden, but he was in offensive hell before Bojan came back. 
Now Bojan is back. He's clearly their second best offensive player. Jaden Ivey has been really coming into his own as of late. I think that they are going to beat one of those teams. And everybody is playing hard against Detroit because nobody wants to be the team to lose to them. But Detroit has played really hard these last couple games as well. They certainly, certainly want to win one soon. I think Kate is going to will them there. I think Bojan and Ivey will get hot enough. I think that they'll do it. And the other thought that I had yesterday is it is insane, insane that this team is on pace to be the worst regular season basketball team ever. I made a TikTok a couple weeks back, like talking about if they could beat the 1973 Sixers, who are the worst regular season team ever over a full 82 game season. They were nine and 73. And hilariously, like they had a decent amount of good talents on that team. They had Fred Carter. They had Van Arsdell who they traded John Block for that season. So he was an all-star. Like, if you look at the totality of the names, including the trades, they had some guys who had been really good. Hal Greer was still on that team. He was just really old. Kevin Lockery was still there. If you really are into the grids and have gotten into the weeds with me on some of those guys, you know that they had legit careers. Most of them were just old and they had injuries and stuff and whatnot. But to me, really, the worst team over an A2 game regular season is the 2016 76ers who won 10 games, but oh my God, if you remember that team started one in 30 and their basketball roster is just a joke. I'll just read out to you their leading scorers, okay? This is from the top on down. Jaleel Okafor was their leading scorer. He was out of the league within a few years. Ish Smith was their second leading scorer on 40% from the field. Rocco, who obviously turned into a very good basketball player, wasn't quite there yet and was having to do a little bit too much offensively was shooting 38% from the field. Then it's Nerlens Noel, Isaiah Kanan, Hollis Thompson. Like, it's ridiculous the dudes they were relying on. Nick Stauskas started half the games this year. That's the worst basketball team I've seen put out there, along with the 2012 Bobcats. And I look at this Pistons team, and I'm like, well, Cade is uh, an all-star talent. He's going to be an all-star. Uh, Saar is still a rare defensive talent. I still like Duran as a two-way big. Bojan is like a legit 18 to 20 point per game score efficiently, really good offensive player. Ivy has offensive pop. Like just the gap between what the worst team in the league looked like eight years ago and what the worst team in the league looks like today is massive. It's massive. And it's such a testament to how great basketball talent around the league is right now. Everybody loves making sports predictions, but there's a new app putting a whole new spin on the game. Check out Vaulted, that's spelled V-L-T-E-D, Vaulted. It's an app where you can track sports predictions and participate in daily cash prize pools. You can also show off your sports knowledge against your friends, your buddies, by your boldest takes, challenging your friends to see who makes the best picks. You can challenge every week in my weekly Colin Cowherd NFL pool. Do that, win money, real money. All you have to do is answer questions and risk confidence points, V-L-T-E-D, Vaulted app, Vaulted Challenge. So download the Vaulted app right now, V-L-T-E-D. The QR code is right there on the screen. Prove you're smarter than your friends and get the Vaulted app today. Really easy and fun to play. This one comes to us from Vegger. Not sure if that's how it's pronounced, Vegger. They ask, if the Grizzlies reach the play-in, what chances do you think they have with the whole roster healthy? So, first of all, I don't think it's likely that they do make the play-in. Because the West is really good and they dug themselves such a hole with jaw out. But it's not impossible. They've only got five games to make up right now between them and the 10 seed. And we know this Grizzlies team is always going to give a hell of an effort in the regular season. Taylor Jenkins gets those dudes to play. And especially when you compare it to some of the other teams. If it's the Lakers, right, who will just take lights, nights off willy-nilly. I think that they'll dial in enough when they need to make the playoff push. But... Teams like the Suns, the Warriors, more veteran teams. They always play really, really hard Memphis. So it's not impossible. I still don't think it's likely though. And if they were to end up in that 9-10, I don't think they're getting into the 7-8 bracket. Versus the Suns or versus the Warriors who could maybe end up there are sitting in that range right now. I would have them as dogs in those situations. Although Jaw has done some awesome stuff rejuvenating this team and just bringing back that really high-level offensive threat that they needed because this offense has been the worst in basketball, the depth still isn't the same. The defense still isn't the same without Steven Adams. 
The rebounding is not nearly the same without Steven Adams. They go from being the best in the league with him to 20-somethings without him. I still don't trust Triple J offensively in a significant role in a playoff setting. I think we have seen him rattled too many times. I think we have seen him get soft, play soft. If his three-pointer isn't falling, which it can be rather inconsistent, he can just fade. And I worry about the shooting on this roster overall. When I compare that to what the Suns have, at least from those two really dynamic shot creators in Katie and Book, even if Beal isn't healthy, I just think those guys are more likely to win you a game. The Warriors, I think their depth is so good and they have Steph Curry. So when you combine that it's going to be tough for them to get there, and even if they do get there, I think they're underdogs just because of how good the West is. I think that this season is probably still lost for Memphis, but if they could get there and draw the Rockets, all respect to the Rockets, that team has been grinding defensively. They are legit. The veteran ads that they made have contributed more to winning now than I would have anticipated. Shangoon is just a flat-out star. I would take the Grizzlies in that matchup. I would. I think that they have the best player in that matchup. I think that they have three of the four best players in that matchup. And that's enough for me to bet on them. So it, it would be matchup dependent, but just viewing at the entire scope of the play and picture, I think that they are probably still going to miss out this year. Okay. Xavier Johnson asks, why does my dad constantly talk about how cold Mahmoud abdul Rauf was? Because your dad knows ball. Because he was sick. Phil Jackson says he was better than Steph. The first Steph. He was sick. I don't really have a ton more to add. I mean, obviously, ahead of his time shooter. Really fun ball handler. Overall, just a dynamic shot creator. 29 points per game in college. Second all-time in the SEC behind only Pistol Pete Maravich. Pretty good company. And think about just how insane you have to be as an offensive talent to be 6'1", 160, and go third overall. I mean, players who are that small and that slight just not get that sort of priority in the draft. And he was one who did. And maybe he was a little bit underwhelming in the NBA relative to those expectations, but he was still a good NBA player. So shout out to Mahmoud Abdul-Rauf. Clutus Jenkins asks, please recommend your favorite basketball books. Okay. I always go to the same three here. My big three. The Book of Basketball by Bill Simmons. It's just like the most comprehensive overview of NBA history, in my opinion, focusing on the most important players, their stories, ranks all of them, one through 96 in his pantheon. It's basically a must read, I would say. Pistol, awesome biography of Pistol Pete Maravich, who just had a fascinating and really difficult life, really well written. And then The Breaks of the Game, which is... A really great book by David Halberstam about the, I believe it's the 1979-80 Blazers. Three years after they won their title, two years after Bill Russell had left. And just captures a very interesting moment in NBA history. A lot of the issues that were going on then within the league and culturally. And gives you a pretty unique inside look on a basketball team. And a basketball team that had recently been at the apex of the sport and now is just not in that same place anymore those are my big three okay gobbers asks what is my favorite thing about christian brown dog dog i mean there's a few things to like about christian brown he's got swag he's got ups he can shoot it but i would i would say it's just his competitive spirit the guy just makes plays i don't know why i got a question specifically about christian brown but i will answer it because i do think that he's good and also also, he's from Overland Park, Kansas. Shout out to uh, our boy, my boy, Gabe Swartz, who uh, went to the same high school as him. Last few questions here. Carvel asks, what if we just got to know you behind all the rah-rah for once? That's an important question, and I'm going to acknowledge it and respect it. So we have some personal questions down the stretch here, not about the NBA or NFL necessarily. If you're interested, stick around. If you're not, I guess you just don't want to get me get to know me behind all the raw raw for once. Sydney asks, fondest childhood memory. Hmm, there are so many to choose from. I would probably say the first time that I saw Lamar Odom play basketball. I guess I hadn't imagined. You'll have to excuse me if I get emotional here. I guess I just hadn't imagined that there could be a guy at that size, six ten, who could be so athletic so fluid a mover, so dynamic a ball handler, and yet also have that creativity and vision as a passer. But at the same time, I mean, he can kill you on the glass. Like, he can shoot, at least at times. 
that to me was just a revelation about wow people like this really exist and it was very powerful outside of that nothing really stands out that was pretty much it pretty much seeing lamar odom play basketball made my childhood bren asks you rock with dinosaurs or nah yes i do rock with dinosaurs i love dinos i love dinos dinos are sick when i was a kid i wanted to be a paleontologist when i was a very small kid about three or four years old Allosaurus was always my favorite because as a boy, it's actually a similar reason that I loved Lamar Odom. I've said this before, but I had an infatuation with things that I felt were underrated. I would look at an Allosaurus and say it's 90% of a T-Rex with 1% of the hype. Same thing goes for animals. I said that about coyotes with wolves. Not really true. Coyotes are not 90% of wolves. They're more like 120% of a common house dog. But that was my philosophy. I did love dinosaurs. Some great documentaries out there. Prehistoric Planet, Walking with Dinosaurs. They uh, brought back Prehistoric Planet. Good stuff. Lyle Pluridon, not a dinosaur, but probably my favorite ancient sea creature. Pretty sick stuff. Jax asks, what is the best donut flavor? Maple bar, probably. I love donuts. I'm a donut enthusiast. I really am. My favorite national brand is probably Krispy Kreme. But I would prefer just a nice quality local donut shop over everything else. And I love a classic chocolate. But I think that maple flavor, man. Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. There's something to it. There really is. Okay, and then Cammy asks, do you believe in ghosts? Another important question. And one to which I can't really pretend to have an answer. Do I believe in them on a personal level? I haven't had a ghost experience. And whenever I hear about a ghost experience, sure, I treat it with some level of skepticism. But at the same time, who am I to speak for somebody else's experience? There's all sorts of crazy stuff out there that's happened that I've never seen. Now, most of it has been documented in some way that's a bit more legitimate than ghost experiences. And there are other explanations. People hallucinate. People see crazy things. That happens. Or people fill in the gaps with things that are sort of weird and make them out to be more than they really are. But I can't say for sure. I can't say for sure. I have been visited in my sleep by the ghost of Clyde Lavellet, and he was saying some very, very unsavory old fashioned things. And I also just learned, I talk a lot about how the old Hawks were racist with Clyde Lavellet and Cliff Hagen and Bob Pettit. But I learned that all started with Slater Martin. And I felt bad because I've been talking about how I like Slater Martin. Now I don't. I don't like Slater Martin. He made the Hawks racist, apparently. And I should have known. I should have known looking at him. And now, hold on. What's what's that I'm hearing? The ghost of Logan Camden says that if you want more Nerd Sesh content, you can watch our full shows on YouTube, the Nerd Sesh YouTube page. And what's that, buddy? Oh, and you can also listen to the shows just audio on all audio platforms, all podcasting platforms. And he says that if you want to follow us on social media... You can check us out on TikTok and Instagram at Nerd Sesh and Twitter at Nerd underscore Sesh. And he says the Steelers suck. And he says that he's going to be wearing a toupee soon because they're going to miss the playoffs. And it's all true. Every word of what he says is true. And what he left out is you can join our Discord at the link tree in all of our social media bios if you want. And you can... Check us out on Cameo. You can also buy yourself some Nerd Sesh merch. I've got the flag behind me. We've got hats. We've got shirts. We've got hoodies. All that stuff at thevolume.com. So with that, as always, appreciate you guys. Hope you enjoyed this solo episode. Hope you had a wonderful holiday, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever you may celebrate, and New Year incoming. I hope you have an excellent time as well. But we will speak to you before then. So with that, as always, appreciate you guys. I have been Carson Brabber. This was Nerd Sesh. Nerd Sesh.